We'll begin with Tom Mujek, who will talk to us about this. Thank you, Moses. So we have a, have a fundamental need to orient ourselves in space and in time. We have a fundamental desire to know what time it is and to know where we are in space. And today we've got these amazing devices, don't we? And we have probably two or three of them that help us orient ourselves. We, it tells us time to the nanosecond and we know where we are uh, uh, on the planet with remarkable precision. Now, what if you didn't have this device? What if you had no electricity? What if you had no mechanical clock, no watch? How would you know where you were? How would you know what time it was? How would you know what the date was? Well, it turns out this is a question that people have struggled, these are questions that people struggled with for a long time, and they too, like us, had a series of magical devices. It's a device that, um, has been around for probably 16, 1700 years. It uh, was pervasive across North Africa, all of Europe, the Middle East, and most of, uh, uh, of, of Asia. It was known by just about every educated person. In fact, it was taught in elementary school, how to understand this device, and almost no one knows of it today. And what I'd like to do today in my time is to share with you how to tell time and how to know where you are with this device called the Astrolabe. So the Astrolabe is commonly thought of as the world's first astronomical computer. Oh, and I'm going way too fast here. And uh, let me show it to you. So, Here's the device here. This is a, a replica of uh, an astrolabe. It, and as you can see, it's made up of brass. It's got all kinds of uh, dials and settings, and you can uh, identify dates, and you can identify constellation names. And there's uh, even settings on the back that are used for a variety of other purposes. So this is a replica and, um, the, uh, of a 16th century astrolabe that uh, would, if we had the original one here, here, would cost about as much as two high park houses. And I'm talking fully detached, you know, fully renovated houses. These things are insanely expensive, and the ones that are even older, that are in the 15th and 14th and 13th and 12th and 9th centuries, are probably as much as Moses' houses, or at least a small part of it. It's really expensive stuff. So um, let me illustrate and show you what the, the different parts of the astrolabe are, and then we can sh understand how to use it. And what I think you'll find is it's, it's an amazing brain scratch, because it helps you understand how the sky works, and what time really is, or at least how we conceive of time. So the astrolabe has different parts. So the first part, hello, oh here, yeah, went back too bad, far. Uh, the first part is called the mater, and that means the mother, and it's the case that holds everything in place. Um, the spinny part is called the reet, and it holds the positions of the sun, moon, and planets, okay? Uh, inside the mater is another part which is called the plate. Now, actually, it, um, there's several plates in most astrolabes, and they correspond to the positions of the stuff in the local sky. This will become clear in a second. And so the astrolabe brings these different components together, different parts of the sky together, into one single compact device that's used for, as you'll see, a crazy number of things. So it also has a sighting device called and Adelaide that brings it all together. Now, this might seem really complicated to you. Um, do you remember when you first set up email on your iDevice? That seemed complicated the first time you did it. But the first manual that was produced uh, of this device was, was in English, was produced by a fellow named Geoffrey Chaucer, the poet, and he wrote it to his 11-year-old uh, son, his 11-year-old son named Little Lewis. And in this book, it explained uh, about 80 different things that you can do with the astrolabe, as well as how to make one of these devices. And it's astonishing that 11-year-old kids living in the 13th, 14th century uh, in England would know about this. About a quarter of their education was dedicated to uh, understanding the astronomical world. So. Um, the first big idea that was illustrated in uh, Chaucer's text is a, a concept of how do you get the sky, the three-dimensional sky that completely surrounds us onto a flat, portable device. And that's used for map making. It's a tough challenge, isn't it? And it actually is born from some mathematics that was invented 
in about 150 BC by a guy named Hipparchus. And the idea is you imagine the sky as a large celestial sphere completely enveloping you. And then you imagine a flat surface on the bottom of the sphere, a little bit below it, that projects or receives stuff from the sky. And so you project the three-dimensional sphere onto the surface of the device. Okay, this is called... Um, stereographic projection, and is common in map making, and that's the basic idea. You just imagine projecting everything from the sphere through the point on the bottom onto the flat surface. And so interesting things happen when you do that. So all the bright stars uh, that we'll see actually correspond to different parts of the astrolabe, uh, the celestial equator, the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, moon, and planets through the sky, it's the plane of the solar system, also gets projected. And what's interesting about this is that certain geometric properties are preserved. Circles are circles and straight lines are straight lines. And as a result of that, magic happens. The second big insight that emerged from this is that the sky actually doesn't have just one coordinate system, it's got a couple. There is the, um, the, uh, the position of the fixed stars on the celestial sphere, and then there's the local sky. So there's two different kinds of skies that we have to contend with if we, know, if we need to understand where we are and when we are. So the local sky coordinates are kind of tilted, that's, and, uh, and I'll show you where those are located. Two different parts of the sky, uh, sky or two different references of the sky, correspond to diff two different parts of the astrolabe. So the REIT shows the positions of the sun moon and planets, now that's the ecliptic, and then the local sky is represented by the plate. Don't worry, this gets a, a, it's a big brain scratch, but the actual use of it is insanely simple. The astrolabe brings it all together, and the third big insight is that the sky moves, and so must the astrolabe, pivoting around the north star, which is at the center of the device. Okay? So, this is a computer or a model of the sky. And when you dial up the astrolabe so that it corresponds to the real sky, you have an amazing, accurate model of the entire universe as it was known in the palm of your hands that would correspond to the entire night or the daytime sky. That's the magic of it. That's the beauty of it. So how do you tell the time? So um, telling the time is... Um, well, let me show you in two ways. If only we had this, uh, the uh, sun that we could look at uh, and, and, and proj Oh, yeah, there we go. Well, so um, here's the quick and dirty way of how to tell time with the astrolabe. It's just a, a number of quick steps. First thing I do is I sight the sun up here and I see its angle in the sky or the altitude. I measure the altitude and it's about um, 55 degrees. I then find out what the date is, and the date uh, is the uh, last, let's just say it's the end of June here, and if you see, um, that corresponds to a certain degree of angle. It's the last degree of uh, 30 degrees of Gemini. So 30 degrees Gemini is where the sun is in the sky. Then I look on this scale here, that's the path of the sun, moon, and planets. I find Gemini. Okay, and so I know that point right there is where the sun is in the sky. And then all I need to do is map it to where it corresponds to 55 degrees altitude. And that corresponds to that little spider web there. So I'm just going to say it's there for now. And then the final thing I just need to do is just take where the um, 30 degree Gemini is there and then make that line here. And then it tells me the time here. Okay, so uh, it's about 2.15 if I made that measurement. And if I did it without having to explain it to you, it would take about seven seconds or so to actually do it. Here's what um, it looks like in slow, or actually spelt out. Telling the time in the daytime, we measure the sun's altitude. Okay. From there, we find out where the sun is in the sky, on the ecliptic. We identify that position. We correspond it to the sun's altitude. That's the thing in the back. Al McHunter. And then we move the dial so it corresponds. And then finally, we have the sun's hour. So that's how you tell the time. And that's how millions and millions of people told the time because there was no other way. There were no clocks. 
and it had, we had a very different appreciation of what time is. So what is time? Can you capture it? You know, we think of time now as being segmented in these small units of increments that are completely synchronized around the planet. But no, back in the day, time was certainly not um, that. Time is an amorphous, completely abstract human concept that we all feel but we can't put our fingers onto. So we needed so some type of device to be able to make sense of time. And the way in which people did that is by taking and measuring the most reliable time-keeping uh, device on the plan uh, in the world, which was the rotation of the planet. Okay, can you do this in the nighttime? Absolutely. The way you would do this is just take one extra step. You'd find a bright star. Those of you who are astronomers will recognize this as the Summer Triangle. We identify the star called Deneb. We measure the altitude of Deneb. We find Deneb on the reed. It's a little pinpoint. We put Deneb's altitude onto uh, the... Uh, move the reed so that it measures to the exact point. And then from there, we have an accurate map of the sky. And then from there, we would find where the sun is. And the sun would be below the horizon because it's dark, right? And then you'd be able to tell the, the sun's hour. So that's how people to told the time back in the day. So if you think about this, what's really going on is this is the first um, computational platform that, was, that lasted for 1,500 years. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, think of how long Apple or open source or the web has been around. This is the fundamental timekeeping device that was used throughout Western civilization. The markings on the front and the back corresponded to individual applications, different kinds of uses. And I've just shown you two uses. So uh, little Lewis was learned about 70, 80 different applications. There's a, um, uh, a book by a fellow named Masa Allah written in 680 uh, in uh, um, Saudi Arabia that describes about 330 applications, and there's one book, Lost to Antiquity, that describes about a thousand different applications. So it was super popular in uh, the world of Islam. Why? Because in Islam you need to pray towards this Kaaba, um, the center of Islam, five times a day. And so the callers would need to find out when the exact five time uh, periods were. And they actually corresponded to the position of the sun in the sky, which could be easily marked on uh, the edge of the astrolabe. So what would be a really complicated and difficult thing to do was we just, you know, take a couple of measurements in the sky uh, and the caller would, call, would uh, deliver the call to prayers. It all corresponded to the position of the sun in the heavens. And uh, so, it's, uh, it's, so, so, so that's one application. Um, by the way, if you were going to do this with traditional algebra, uh, it, these are the equations that would be required to be able to make those calculations uh, to actually set. And it's super hard. This is like third, fourth year university, uh, you know, astrophysics stuff to be able to calculate this stuff, but it's embedded in the geometry of this device. Isn't that cool? You know, it's actually built in to the device. So. Um, it was also used, uh, there are different versions of the astrolabe were used by uh, early Christians for, again, about 1,500 years um, for times to prayer as well. And they had to pray eight times a day as opposed to uh, five or seven in the, in the traditional. So there were apps for astronomical calculations, there were apps for horoscopes, apps for terrestrial calculations, applications um, for you know, universal astrolabes that could be used all around the planet at any latitude. There's a particular flavor of an astrolabe um, called the nautical or the mariner's astrolabe, a little bit different than this one here, a little bit more of a sextant uh, than, this, uh, than what I've shown you. And it's actually used to advance mathematics. Think of it as a slide rule or a circular slide rule or a calculator. So these things, um, I mean, literally you can take an entire education of how the sky worked and how mathematics worked as a result of this. And we, no one's heard of this. I mean, it's just astonishing. Again, beautiful views of this. So there are probably about a thousand astrolabes known uh, in museum collections, probably two or three more uh, number, uh, uh, two or three thousand more in private collections. And the vast majority of them, as you would expect, are made out of metal. They're, they're made up of, of brass. Um, 
And of course, that would make sense because these are the, the, the materials that would actually survive. And uh, the astrolabe was probably the most um, important instrument that advanced metallurgy in the day because this thing needed to be durable, it needed to be um, uh, waterproof, it needed to uh, s survive that for thousands of years, and uh, hence brass was the main uh, uh, material. Check this out. So this is an amazing uh, drawing, and this just shows you the, the or amazing intricacy of the, the detail. Um, and I think what's amazing here is that it has asymmetrical stars, the little daggers, those are the stars, on a symmetrical field. So the artistry is just phenomenal. So you and I probably couldn't afford a brass astrolabe back in the day, but if we were university students, we would be able to afford wood astrolabes. And so probably for every one brass astrolabe, there was 10 to 50 wooden astrolabes. Very few of these would uh, sur uh, are, have survived. And uh, if you were an 11-year-old kid, probably your astrolabe would be made up of paper. And so, in fact, there were books that, were, that would show you how to uh, make this device and how to actually uh, use this device from paper. in your back pocket, completely disposable, uh, the world's first computer, kind of like uh, uh, the, the, computer that, the computers that we have today. So why the astrolabe? So to me, these things are fascinating. I built my first one out of paper uh, about 35 years ago, back in the Uni University of Toronto, a few blocks away from here. And I, I think what I learned from this is the value of elegant design, the value of really thinking through form and function, to bring together modular systems that are interchangeable, to appreciate that direct, manipu direct manipulation makes all the difference when you can really control something. And of course, the beautiful aesthetic. I mean, you can actually tell uh, just by the shape or the gesture of these daggers where these devices came from and who made them and what their origins were. Um, and it's also kind of really interesting, I think, that these devices have actually in inspired much of astronomy and many other things. In fact, there were a whole class of books in the 16th century with things called volvels. They're actually paper cutouts that spun around, computers within computers within computers, and this device. Some of the earliest clocks actually uh, had astrolabes. So there are buildings throughout the, the Middle East and also uh, in India that uh, are giant versions of astrolabes called the Jantar Mantar. And and um, uh, the most advanced clock that Stuart Brand, I'm not sure if he's spoken here before, um, uh, is designed to last 10,000 years and actually uh, takes uh, many lessons from the astrolabe. So I don't use astrolabes now. I designed high-end software <laughs> uh, to, uh, 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 for uh, the entertainment and visual effects industries as well as for the building industry, manufacturing industry. But I still kind of think about the astrolabe. And I think the thing that sort of uh, I appreciate most in, in designing visual effects software that was used to design this is that how software and how uh, these kinds of tools help us change our mental models. Oh, could we press the forward button? You just got to see this in great animation. Could you press the forward button? Oh, can you go reverse, press the forward button? No? Okay. So. What software allows us to do, and what stuff like this allows us to do, is to change our mental model on the abstract. And in thinking about space, people thousands of years ago had these devices that elect, allowed them to directly connect their imaginations into space. As we develop our tools, we have a trade-off. We gain some things and we lose some things. And what we gain is this remarkable precision and this ability to envision, well, perhaps the entire universe. And that is truly amazing. And by the way, we still visualize the celestial sphere in this giant uh, cosmic zoom out. Um, but we lose something as well. And I think what we lose is that direct appreciation, that direct connection of what it means for it something to be, for it to be 215, what it means where, uh, to know where north is, and what it means oh, to be out of time. With that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, while we're taking a picture of the next shift, please come up. <laughs> I love that.
It's remarkably sophisticated. It is. Though, really. It's sort of like For Blaine, the 1500 and 1600? First ones are 680. Do we know who invented them? Uh, not one person, but the first person Thank to write you. about it. Great. Masa'ala. Let's take mm. you in the back. Okay. Thanks, John. That way. Great. 